if somebody were to have a blood transfusion, would that in any case, um, you know, change their LRA results or skew the results in case, you know, given that all their blood counts are okay? Right, right, right. Now, we do have to have a certain number of white blood cells, particularly lymphocytes, in order to see the lymphocyte reactions in the laboratory. Uh, and that's a different subject uh, than, than what you're addressing. Um, very important question. Uh, people often get transfusions, either electively or urgently. Um, and the answer is, let's say you get a unit of blood. How many unit equivalents do you have in your body? Well, the answer is 8 to 10. So the blood is going to add maybe 10% and mix with the rest of you. And the white cells, because by the way, when you get a transfusion, you're mostly getting red cells. They don't want to give you extra volume. They want to give you extra plasma. So it's usually packed red cells. They usually don't give you platelets unless you're bruising and bleeding, and that's a different category entirely. So when you get a unit of blood, you are getting some new red cells, but we don't measure red cells. So for example, if you have a transfusion once a month, your hemoglobin A1C will be affected and must be interpreted differently. But your immune responses are indifferent. However, you need to have over a thousand lymphocytes and generally, that means a white count over, say, 2,000 total, whereas the white count of a typical person will be 8 to 10,000, and it can go up to 20, 40, 50,000 under stress. So transfusion has really less effect on LRA lymphocyte response assays than when, once you think it through. It has very little effect on the results. Um, if there is a sequencing, we would suggest drawing the LRA test just before rather than just after a transfusion that reduces certain stress responses, it reduces certain uncertainty. Um, but there's no contraindication uh, between someone receiving a transfusion and then subsequently having the LRA test. We would prefer to do the LRA test before a transfusion in the same way that there are a number of medicines that cycle, that are given periodically, and we generally say, Take the LRA test the day before or just before the next uh, dose of the medicine, uh, just before uh, the next transfusion. Thank you. That addresses it perfectly. Thank you. Uh, I believe that's it, unless uh, Faye, Vula, any last questions? Yes, any other questions? We're on a roll. I don't, I don't have anything. I, one just occurred to me as a follow-up to Bula's question. Uh, if someone has had a organ transplant and is on an immunosuppressive drug, that would contribute to the LRA test uh, or impact it, I presume? Y yes. You, you must follow the quote preparation, which means four days of steroids, two days without aspirin and antihistamine, 12 hours of water only. And those pre-analytic requirements or determinants uh, are part of why we get such precise results. So we're, we're, we're not concerned, when you follow the rules, we're not concerned about false negatives and false positives. We do run, as you know, a control, a negative and positive control, with every specimen. So we do our best to make sure there aren't pre-activated cells in the blood when we receive it, the negative should be negative control. And we want to make sure that you, the cells can respond. That's why we have a positive control. In fact, we then compare people to themselves. So we don't compare people to some abstract artificial theoretical standard. We actually use the negative and positive controls to tell us what the individual's response looks like. And then we compare people to themselves, each item that we measure. So we're able to get more accurate information as long as people do the quote preparation. Now, today's organ transplants often do not have long-term immunosuppression therapies because of the adverse consequences. So if you have a really good match, 
in regard to a kidney or even a liver transplant. The most advanced medical centers are using minimal, minimal post-operative immunosuppression and only for the shortest possible times to make sure the body is compatible with the transplant. That's why you gave the immunosuppressive drugs in the past. But what Tom Starzl and others have found is that the less immunosuppression you give to post-transplant people, <laughs> the better the long-term outcomes are. So that's exciting. And then for the people who are on steroids, either because of transplantation or for whatever medical need, we have the steroid bridge. And we recommend two weeks or more of the steroid bridge so that you can taper any steroids that the people are on so that people can be off the steroids and use the steroid bridge alone for at least four days. And then if appropriate and, and clinically and medically needed, you can restart the steroids. Uh, but the steroid bridge was specifically developed and we've used it over the decades to help people bridge so that they can be off the steroids for the four days necessary so that we can do a good job of determining what's burdening their immune system, uh, what they're tolerant to, that they can digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden, and then how to substitute uh, from hidden sources of those antigens, uh, including cross-reactive antigens. Uh, sometimes it's not just the food, it's the antigen in the food that cross-reacts with the pathogen in the gut. That's kind of interesting, and we've uh, worked through some of those issues. So we don't take people off medicines that they need. We do help people bridge using the steroid bridge, uh, usually two or more weeks, so that they can be off the steroids for four days and then restart the immunosuppressive therapy or whatever the medical uh, therapies are needed uh, to uh, maintain and sustain and improve health. 